Hello my friends, now we are going to discuss on photo electrochemical productions of hydrogen using the solar energy. So, as I told already in our last lecture that the production of the hydrogen by so many means. So, in this particular lecture we are going to discuss about the using the solar energy uh, by photo electrochemical productions of the hydrogen process. So, basically the hydrogen is widely considered to be the fuel in the powering of non-polluting vehicles, domestic heatings and the aircrafts. Yes, because hydrogen will become the future fuel for the globe because after certain time maybe the fossil fuels or maybe the petroleum products is going to be finished. So, automatically that uh, gap will be taken care by the hydrogen itself. So, now the abundant supply of water and sunlight offers us an affordable alternative source to produce hydrogen apart from fossil fuels and the biomass. Till now we are discussing about that only we are going to produce the hydrogen from the biomass or maybe the fossil fuels, but there are some other techniques also by which we can produce the hydrogen gas itself. So, that one of the technique is called the photo electrochemical water splitting is one of the potential techniques for clean solar hydrogen productions and has been utilized in small to large scale hydrogen generators. In the year of 1972, Honda and Fujishima first investigated water splitting using a single titanium dioxide crystal as a photo anode and platinum as a cathode itself. So, now from the right hand side image, you can see that how in the y axis it is there that the relative emissions of the carbon. So, if we talk about the combustion of engine by using gasoline it is too high, but same times if we talk about the hybrid electric internal combustion engine using gasoline, so that time it is little bit reduced. But now you come to the last part, this is the most important part, because where we are using the fuel cell using the hydrogen from solar, wind, then tidal, hydrothermal or maybe the hydroelectric case. So, in this case you see the emissions is very, very less. So, that is why the people or maybe the scientists are nowadays tending to the hydrogen productions and the hydrogen storage for the future fuel, because first of all it will fill the gap of the scarcity of the fossil fuels and the petroleum products as well as it will reduce the pollutions to the environment. And then from the bottom we can see that now that is a very good triangle. Basically, the triangle consists of the source or which is nothing but the sunlight, then electricity which is nothing but the prime carrier and the hydrogen is storage and fuel. Now, if we convert from sunlight to electricity, we are doing basically by the photovoltaic cell itself. Now, if we talk about from electricity to the hydrogen, then basically we are talking about the fuel cells and maybe the electrolysis techniques. And when directly we are taking the sunlight to the hydrogen storage or maybe the productions, then basically we are doing the photoelectrolysis kind of things. So, that is the beautiful image by which we can understand that if we convert one energy or maybe the sunlight to the hydrogen storage or maybe the electricity, what we need to do. Now, what is the working principle? Basically, it is based on the conversion of the light energy into electricity within a cell involving two electrodes. So, you can see that that is the number one electrode which is acting as a cathode and another one is acting as an anode. So, basically two electrodes we are using over here immersed in an aqueous electrolyte. So, this basically the aqueous electrolyte over there of which at least one is made of a semiconductor exposed to light and able to absorb the light. That means, in between these two electrode, one electrode should be the photo electrode. Means, when the direct sunlight will come onto that electrode, it should react. So, that is the case. So, that is why in this particular case, we are using the photo anode, where the sunlight or maybe the frequency of the light is coming and heating. This electricity is then used for water electrolysis. Now, there are three options for the arrangement of photo electrodes in the assembly of PECs. Photo anode made of n type semiconductor and cathode made of metal. Photo anode made of n type semiconductor and photo cathode made of p type semiconductor. Photo cathode made of p type semiconductor and anode 
made of metal. So, that is a combination either one may be the semiconductor, one may be the metal or may be it can be the opposite. So, it depends upon whether that material or maybe the semiconducting material is the n type or maybe the p type. Then what is the reaction mechanism? So, what are photoelectrolysis using a PC involves several process within photoelectrodes and at the photoelectrode or maybe the electrolyte interface including light induced intrinsic ionization of the semiconducting material resulting in the formation of electronic charge carriers which is happening in this particular case itself when the sunlight or maybe the light is directly coming to the photoelectrode itself. What is happening? The happening is taking place this one. Then 2 H nu is tends to 2 electron it is giving and plus 2 whole pair basically it is giving. So, now where H is the Planck's constant, nu is the frequency, E is the E minus is the electron and H plus is nothing but the hole. So, that means it is generating 2 hole and 2 electron simultaneously. Now, oxidation state, oxidation of the water at the photo anode by the holes itself 2 H plus plus H 2 because now in this particular case we are having that water also water content. So, that basically producing the oxygen gas plus 2 H plus ion. So, now transport of H plus ions from the photo anode to the cathode through the electrolyte and transport of electrons from photo anode to the cathode through the external circuit. Now, the circuit actually coming into the picture by which this H plus ion is directly going through here and now what is happening? Reduction is taking place of the hydrogen ion that is 2 plus H plus plus 2 E minus which is producing the hydrogen gas. So, basically the hydrogen gas is taking place place into the cathode. Now, what are the extra electron will go? So, now we have connected these two by which the electron is flowing and from there basically we are capturing the electron itself or maybe the vice versa things then electron basically it is passing through over here then electron is coming to the cathode 2 H H plus ion is coming over here and then 2 H plus 2 E it is creating the hydrogen gas in this particular zone. So, basically we are doing the short circuiting kind of things by which the electron is coming to the cathode and H plus ion is coming by the transport and then H plus ion and E and then it is producing the hydrogen gas over there. Now, what is the PEC cell structure? The PEC cell structure categorized as follows like single photoelectrode PEC system, bi photoelectrode PEC system, hybrid photoelectrode PEC system, photoelectrode sensitized through incorporation of particles of noble metals, photoelectrode sensitized through dye depositions. So, basically this is talking about the PEC cell structure. Now, we are going to discuss one by one. So, first is called the single photoelectrode PEC system. The single photoelectrode PEC system similar to that reported by Fujishima and Honda in 1972 is equipped with one photoelectrode while the second electrode is not the light sensitive or maybe the mostly metals. So, how we are coming to the latest? So, this is the first primary studies has been done by some scientists where they have used one photoelectrode and the other is also not the photoelectrode maybe that is some kind of other metals itself. Next one is called the bi photoelectrode PEC systems. In the bi photoelectrode PEC system is based on the use of semiconducting materials as both photoelectrodes. Now, anode and cathode both are the same materials. In this case N and P type materials are used as the photo anode and photo cathode respectively. So, one should be the N type another should be the P type semiconductor materials. The advantage of such system is that photovoltage are generated on both electrodes resulting in consequence in the formation of an overall photovoltage that is sufficient for water decomposition without the applications of a bias voltage. Next is called the hybrid photoelectrode HPE. So, the structure of the HPE involving the metal contact that is silicon photovoltaic cell, photoanode of titanium dioxide and aqueous electrolyte. So, in this particular case you can see that is the number 1 electrode over here which is acting as a metal materials. So, metal electrode it is known as outside is the waterproof coating basically we are using. Now, we are using the silicon of two type one is the n type silicon another one is called the p type silicon and then top of that we are using another titanium dioxide thin film and 
the whole thing is immersed into the liquid electrolyte itself. Now, what is happening? The light is coming into the titanium dioxide, light is coming to the interface in between the n type and p type semiconductor. So, what is happening? In this structure, only the Ti2 layer is exposed to the aqueous environment. Now, see only the liquid is acting in this particular liquid is unable to go inside it while the silicon solar cell forms a sub layer that is not in contact with the electrolyte. So, this is under the electrolyte means it is not touching with the liquid electrolyte itself. The silicon solar cell is used to generate a photovoltage that can be caused as an internal electrical bias. Consequently, this type of HP cell is expected to exhibit intrinsic, intrinsic means the spontaneous emissions. So, basically the spontaneous performance in the absence of an external bias. So, in this case what happened? The electrochemical cells what we are putting over there now this is the whole structure over there. So, I am having that metal electrode then n type uh, silicon then p type silicon then I am having that titanium dioxide then I am having that liquid electrolyte over there. So, in this particular case what happened water plus 2 H plus ion. So, it is uh, it is forming 2 H plus plus half oxygen. So, it is generating the oxygen in this particular case which that is why the oxygen is coming out from the system itself. In this particular point what is happening 2 H plus again the, it is taking 2 electron and then it is forming the hydrogen gas and it is coming out from the system itself. So, in this particular case the H means the hole basically this is the hole 2 H prime means nothing but the 2 hole. So, basically the whole movement is taking place and electron movement is taking place into the opposite directions that is the basic semiconductor theory. So, if the electron will move into one directions the opposite directions the hole will be moving. So, the electrochemical chain incorporated with the H p is shown in the second figure itself. Next, the fourth one is called the photoelectrode sensitized through incorporation of particles of noble metals. Photoanodes, for example, titanium dioxide thin plumes may be sensitized by incorporation of small particles of the noble metals such as silver or maybe the platinum or maybe sometimes the both, thus forming a dispersed system involving micron sized particles. Now, the nanotechnology has come into the picture. So, people are trying to incorporate some kind of nano level fillers into the system so that we can get the better efficiency from it. Then the fifth one is called the photoelectrode sensitized through dye depositions. The conversion efficiency may be increased substantially through dye sensitization of photoelectrodes. The photosensitizer which is an organic dye is physically attached to the surface of the photoelectrode. So, now we are introducing another materials to the photoelectrode simple some dye synthesized materials we are going to do uh, either we are going to deposit or maybe we are going to do the some kind of wrapping or maybe coating onto the photoelectrode itself. So, light absorption by the dye leads to the transformation of the dye molecules from the ground state to the excited state that means also it is creating certain kind of hole over there. So, now dye when it is getting the frequency light frequency. So, automatically it is became the dye prime. The transition from the excited state to a higher oxidation state that means dye prime to dye plus results in the formations of the electrons that means it is releasing one electrons over there. Consequently, the oxidized dye molecules react with water resulting the formation of O2 at the photo anode. So, dye plus plus half H2O. So, dye plus one fourth O oxygen plus H plus ion it is giving and at H2 at the cathode same thing, same thing like the previous one. Then the electron is coming over there, H plus ion is coming over there and they are mixing together and they are forming the hydrogen gas which is taking place at the cathode. So, the dye synthesized semiconducting photoelectrode exhibits two functions basically one is called the absorption of light by the dye and the charge transport by the semiconductor itself. Dye sensitization may lead to sustainable performance of photoelectrodes only when sensitizers exhibit a stable performance in aqua solutions yes because whatever the dye we are going to use that should be stable in the aquatic solutions or maybe the aqua solutions. It should not be degrade or maybe it should not be dissolved. 
Now, what is the performance of PECs is considered in terms of excitations of electrons, hole pairs in photoelectrodes, charge separation in photoelectrodes, electrode process and related charge transfer within PECs and generation of PEC voltage required for the water decompositions. So, these all are the four different performance by which the total efficiency of these particular systems can exist. Criteria for choosing materials of the PEC cell, basically the material which have the band gap energy more than or may be equivalent to 2 volt. It should have high optical absorption properties. It should have high electron mobility, stability in strong electrolytes because otherwise may be we are using some kind of salts or maybe some kind of acids, it should not react with the electrolytes itself. It should be non-corrosive that means after reacting or maybe after uh, dissolutions, it should not create any corrosiveness to the electrodes or maybe to the container itself and it should have high catalytic properties. Now, what kind of materials nowadays the scientists are using? Basically, they are using the carbon dope, titanium dioxide, nanocrystalline flame, titanium dioxide, nanotube arrays, zinc oxide nanostructures, zinc oxide combinations of the composites like aluminum, zinc oxide with nickel core shell nanorod structure. So, it is a one kind of hybrid structure, hematite nanorods arrays, then tungsten oxide nanoware arrays. So, what is the key functional properties of the photoelectrodes? The material used for photoelectrodes satisfies several specific functional requirements with respect to semiconducting and the electrochemical properties. Although these properties have been identified, it is difficult to process materials such that all requirements are satisfied. Yes, of course, because when you are going to introduce a new materials, so of course, it is going to increase certain properties, but simultaneously it is going to decrease certain properties also. So, all together all property will increase by a particular material, it is really, really difficult to prepare. Now, the first one is called the band gap. It is an important quantity of for material that are candidates for photoelectrodes. So, as I told already, the band gap should be equivalent to the 2 volt. A material which satisfies high band gap and corrosion resistance is not available commercially. Therefore, there is need to process such a material. Researchers are working on hybrid photoelectrode involving a stack of materials of different band gaps where each of these absorbs light of different wavelength. So, that means automatically we can get the equivalent of the 2 volt over there as a band gap. Then the second one is called the Scott key barrier. Scott key barrier is very famous phenomenon because the scientist who has invented this one is name was the Scott key. So, basically by his name, this is known as the Scott key barrier. Basically, this is taking place at the metal and the semiconductor interface itself. So, this phenomena is taking place. The Scott key barrier plays an important role in preventing recombinations of the charge formed as a result of photo ionization. An electrical potential barrier across the surface layer can be formed as a result of the following. Structural deformations within the near surface layer due to an excess of surface energy. So, basically it is taking place in this particular zone itself. Segregation induced chemical potential gradients of allovalent having different valence ions across the surface layer imposed during processing. Chemical potential gradients of allovalent ions across the surface layer imposed as a result of surface processing. So, basically this is a one kind of phenomena is basically happening in this particular junction case where the metal and semiconductor are coming into the contact. The use of this procedure requires in situ monitoring of the surface versus bulk electrochemical properties during the processing of the electrode materials. Next one is called the electrical resistance. The major source of energy loses derived from the ohmic resistance of the external and internal circuits of the PEC including electrodes, electrolyte, electrical leads or maybe the wires, electrical connections, measuring and control equipment. In order to achieve the maximum conversion efficiency, the electrical resistances of all of these item must be minimized. So, that is the prime considerations over here. Next, the fourth one is called the Helmholtz potential barrier. 
the charge transfer from the semiconductor to the electrolyte leads to the formations of a surface charge and results in upwards band bending forming a potential barrier as shown in this particular image. This surface charge is compensated by a charge of the opposite sign which is induced in the electrolyte within a localized layer known as the Helmholtz layer basically. So, in this particular case what is happening as I told already the surface charge is compensated by a charge of the opposite sign. So, if one should be the minus the same equivalent the plus will be there which is induced in the electrolyte within a localized layer. So, in this particular case you can see so layer formations is taking place in the electrolyte known as the Helmholtz layer. It is almost equivalent to the 1 nanometer thick and is formed of oriented water molecules dipoles and electrolyte ions adsorbed at the electrode surface. So, basically when you are using the two electrode some water molecule can stick onto the electrode itself. The height of this potential barrier known as Helmholtz barrier is determined by the nature of the aqueous environment of the electrolyte and the properties of the photoelectrode surface. So, that is the case over here. Next the fifth one is called the corrosion and photocorrosion resistance. An essential requirement for the photoelectrode is resistance to reactions at the solid liquid interface resulting in degradation of its properties. These reactions includes electrochemical corrosion, photocorrosion and the dissolution. Any form of reactivity results in a change in the electrical compositions and the related properties of the electrode and photoelectrode. These processes are particularly damaging to the properties of the photoelectrode where these photoelectrodes are essential for photoconversion. Therefore, is essential for the photoelectrodes to be resistance to these types of undesired reactions. Then the sixth one is called the microstructure. It is anticipated that future commercial photoelectrodes will be polycrystalline rather than the single crystal. So far this is little known of the effect of interfaces such as surface linear defects caused by the grain boundaries on photoelectrochemical properties of the photoelectrodes. Because when you are preparing the photoelectrodes at the surface if it is not so smooth or maybe some cracks or maybe some pores are present. So, that time it creates little bit of the problem. So, that we have to minimize. Therefore, there is an urgent need for the following understanding of the effect of the microstructure of polycrystalline photoelectrodes, especially that of the surface structural defects on the photoelectrochemical properties. Development of interface processing technologies leading to the optimizations of the energy conversion efficiency of photoelectrodes of polycrystalline materials. So, this is the another conditions. Now, how we are going to choose the system? The search for high performance photoelectrodes for solar hydrogen generation includes a wide range of compounds of different compositions, structure, microstructure and electronic structure. While the highest conversion efficiency has been achieved for valence semiconductors such as gallium arsenide, gallium indium phosphorus, aluminum gallium arsenide. These compounds are not promising for practical application because of high costs and poor chemical stability in water itself. On the other hand metal oxides like titanium dioxide exhibit much better stability in water and are less expensive than the valence semiconductors. The additional advantage of titanium dioxide is its high non stoichiometry and complex defect disorder which can be used for manipulation with defect related properties itself. Now, what is the solar energy conversion efficiency? The overall efficiency of a PEC unit which is known as the solar conversion efficiency that is the sigma c basically can be defined according to the following formula. So, this is the basically the formula where del g prime h 2 o is the Gibbs free energy of formation for 1 mole of liquid water that is, is equal to 237.141 kilojoule per mole 237.141 kilojoule per mole. So, this is the thing. Next RH2 is the rate of hydrogen generations that is mole per second. So, this is the second one. Then V bias is the bias voltage applied to the cell that is also in volt unit. So, this is the case and of course, I here the I is called the 
current within the cell that is in ampere. I r is this one is the incidence of solar irradiance which depends on geographical locations, time and weather conditions that is watt per meter square and capital A is the irradiated area that is into the meter square. So, by these equations basically we can get the solar conversion efficiency of the PEC unit. Now, what are the advantages? PEC technology depends on solar energy which is renewable source, it is environmentally safe with no undesirable byproducts, it may be used on both large and small scales. And of course, there are certain disadvantages too, difficult to get solar energy in the cloudy weather that is there, it may require complicated optical setups, device stability, durability, reliability and robustness are major challenges of PEC commercializations that is true. That is why the people are still trying to work on it, so that it can be more durable, it can be more reliable or maybe it can be very rigid or maybe the robust, so that in uh, outside uh, any environment whether it is a hot or cold or maybe the rainy season, it can withstand the temperature differences with the environment itself. So, still the scientists are working on this particular area. Now, we have come to the last slide of this particular lecture. So, in summary we can say that photoelectrochemical water splitting is one of the potential technique for clean solar hydrogen productions and has been utilized in small to large scale hydrogen generators. Second, water photoelectrolysis using a PC involves ionization, oxidation, transport and reduction process within photoelectrodes and at the photoelectrode electrolyte interfaces. Photovoltages are generated on both electrodes in bi photoelectrode PEC system resulting in formation of an overall photovoltage that is sufficient for water decompositions without the applications of a bias. A material which satisfies high band gap and corrosion resistance is not available commercially. Therefore, there is a need to process such a material. Photoelectrodes should be resistant to undesired reactions itself. So, this is all about the photoelectrochemical water splitting by sunlight itself. Thank you.